In this Math 2203 video, we're going to take a look at basis and dimension of vector spaces. First, we'll define them, and we'll take a look at standard bases and standard dimensions for uh, most of the vector spaces we're going to work with in the rest of the course. We'll also take a look at an example of a non-standard basis, and then we'll move into properties of basis and dimension. The big theorem in this section is going to be called the plus-minus theorem. First, let's define what a basis is. A finite set of vectors is called the basis of a vector space if the following two things are satisfied. All of those vectors in S must be a linearly independent set. Also, the vectors in S must span the vector space V. Next up, let's talk about dimension. The dimension of a vector space V is equal to the number of vectors that are in a basis for V. The dimension is usually denoted as DIM of V, or DIM V. So what I'd like to do next is give you a bunch of examples of what are called standard bases and standard dimensions for vector spaces that we've seen already. Now I want to start with two that you probably would have studied extensively in Linear Algebra 1 and that is the vector spaces R2 and R3. So if we consider these as real vector spaces, we know that the unit vectors i and j, so i runs along the x-axis, j runs along the y-axis, we know that those two vectors are linearly independent, and they span this entire vector space. So they form a basis for R2. So by definition, the dimension of R2 is equal to 2. That's because we have two basis vectors. For R3, we have a similar idea. Uh, we just add k. So we have i, j, and k are our standard unit vectors. Uh, they run along the x, y, and z axes respectively. So the dimension of R3 would be equal to 3. Note that i, j, and k form a linearly independent set, and they span all of R3. So we can generalize this idea from R2 and R3 to the real vector space Rn. In Rn, we're going to have n vectors in our standard basis. Usually, they're labeled as E1, E2, all the way up to En. So E1 has a 1 in the first component, E2 has a 1 in the second component, all the way up to En, which has a 1 in the final component, the nth component. All of these vectors, they will span Rn, and they're all linearly independent, so they form a basis for Rn. The dimension of Rn is equal to n. That's because we have n basis vectors for Rn. Next up, we're going to talk about C2 and C3 as real vector spaces. So these are vector spaces where each component is a complex number, and we have multiplication, a scalar multiplication by a real number. The standard basis for C2 as a real vector space are these four vectors here. 1, 0, i, 0, 0, 1, 0, i. This means that the dimension of C2 is equal to 4. It's actually twice what we would think it is. For C3, we get something very similar. We have six basis vectors, so the dimension of C3 is equal to 6. And if we generalize this idea to the real vector space Cn, this is what we get for our standard basis. So we're going to have n vectors, each with 1s as components. So we have 1 in the first entry, 1 in the second entry, up to a 1 in the nth entry. Then we have another series of n vectors representing the complex bits. So we have i in the first entry, i in the second entry, up to i in the nth entry. So when we add up all of our vectors together, we actually have 2n of them. So that's why the dimension of Cn is equal to 2n. Next, let's look at polynomial vector spaces. So again, I'm going to consider these as real vector spaces. The standard basis for P2 are the three polynomials 1, x, and x squared. They will span P2, and they're all linearly independent. So the dimension of P2 is equal to 3. If we upgrade and go to P3, now we have four polynomials that form the standard basis. Those are 1x, x squared, and x cubed. 
and the dimension of P3 will equal to 4. And if we generalize this idea to the real vector space Pn, this is what we get for our standard basis. We have 1x, x squared, and we keep going until we get to x to the n. And this yields that the dimension of Pn is equal to n plus 1. We have n polynomials that have x's or powers of x's. And then we have that constant polynomial. So that's where the plus 1 comes from. Now let's think about the real vector space of continuous functions on minus infinity to positive infinity. Well, we could start out with the constant function 1. But that doesn't get all of the continuous functions. The span of 1 will just give us all of the constant functions, like 2, 3, 4, 17, 105. So we have to add in some more functions. So let's try x or x squared. But again, that's not quite going to get us all of the continuous functions. What about something that has x cubed in it, or x to the 7 in it? We can't get that from just 1x and x squared. So we get stuck. We have all of these continuous functions that are made up of polynomials, and we can always get one bigger than the one that we have. So for example, if I have x to the 7, okay, so I'll add in x to the 7 in my basis and I'll be good. No, but then I'm going to have x to the 8. So we can just keep adding more and more in. And we haven't even talked about some of the other crazy functions yet. For example, the sine function, the cosine function, the exponential function, all of these functions are continuous on minus infinity to infinity. So it seems like there is an infinite number of functions that happen to be continuous on minus infinity to infinity. We just, we can't seem to capture all of the information we need. And this is a problem. We can't form a basis for this real vector space. So it's because of this problem that we just obtained that we um, end up with these following two definitions. So if we try to find a basis for our vector space and we notice that there are a finite number of vectors in our basis, then we call the vector space finite dimensional. If we are unable to find a basis for a vector space, it's called infinite dimensional. And finally, here are a couple more notes just regarding dimension. If v happens to be infinite dimensional, then we usually write dim of v is equal to infinity. Also, in case it does come up, the zero vector space is defined to have dimension zero. This is the question that I would like to discuss for a little bit next. Is it possible to have a basis for a vector space that is non-standard? The answer is definitely yes. If the vectors in a particular set that you suspect to be a basis are linearly independent and they span the vector space, then they're definitely a basis. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that this collection of three vectors here forms a basis for the real vector space R3. Now in order to show that something is a basis, we must do two things. We have to check and see whether or not these three vectors are a linearly independent set of R3. And we also have to check that these three vectors span this vector space R3. So to check the linear independence of our vectors, we're going to set up this linear independence equation. So this is one that we saw in the last video, so if you need a refresher, go back and check out that last video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the three vectors in for v1, v2, and v3. And the zero vector of R3 is over here. It just has zeros as all three of the components. And what we're going to do is we're going to group all of these vectors on the left-hand side together. And this is going to lead us to a homogeneous system in A1, A2, and A3. And that homogeneous system looks like this. 
Because a1 is equal to 0, you can quickly check that a2 must also be equal to 0. And if a2 is equal to 0, clearly we have that a3 is equal to 0. So because we have the trivial solution, we know that our set S must be a linearly independent set. Next, we'll move on to part 2. Here we'd like to show that these three vectors span all of our three. So what we have to do is we have to write down a general vector from R3. And again, we have that piece that looks like the linear independence equation. So I have A1 times the first vector, A2 times the second, plus A3 times the third. So again, we're just going to combine all of this together. And comparing those two vectors leads us to this linear system right here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to solve for a1, a2, and a3. So if a1, a2, and a3 have solutions in terms of x, y, and z, then we say that these vectors span all of our three. You'll notice that it's going to be very similar to what we did in part one. We have a1 is equal to y. That implies that a2 is equal to x minus a1, or x minus y. And if a2 is x minus y, then a3 is equal to z minus a2. So it's z minus this. So we get negative x plus y. So we have a solution for a1, a2, and a3 in terms of x's, y's, and z's. So this means that the set S spans R3. Because S is linearly independent and S spans all of R3, we say that S is a basis for R3. What I do want you to notice is how many vectors are in S? Three. What did we say the dimension of R3 was? Three. Not a coincidence.